Please welcome to the stage Douglas Rushkoff. Hey, well, thanks for coming. Gosh, that means a lot to me. I haven't been in Austin in a while, not since the last dot com crash. Um, it's funny, I was at a party of rich people um, just a week, a week and a half ago. And I was not one of the rich people. They bring me really as the entertainment. I'm kind of like a, um, the intellectual's version of a dominatrix for rich people, right? They invite one sort of anarcho-Marxist there to just rib them and tweak them. You know, thank you, Doug, may I please have another? You know, evil capitalists. It's like, oh good, tell me why I'm red. You know, tell me why my company is going to extract all the value out of the world. Right? And I met this, this one dude who had just, he was all excited because he had just finished raising $250 million for a venture fund, right? Which is not a hedge fund, it turns out. He was very upset when I was like, a hedge fund? He goes, no, it's not a hedge fund. It's a venture fund because it's not public. Um, it's like this other kind of thing. Uh, so he had $250 million. I'm like, man, you raised $250 million. Just out of curiosity, when you raise $250 million, like, where do you keep it before you invest it in these companies? And he goes, oh, we got a special place for that called Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> it's the first I hadn't heard of the place before. So now I looked, and you know, they crashed, right? But it's still only $250,000 of the money is guaranteed. So we'll see. But it sounds like there's, what, $249,750,000 for now is gone unless the government decides to come in and help them. You know, and, and I didn't have a good, I mean, I just nodded when, when they said Silicon Valley Bank, because usually what I like to do is tweak wealthy people. I mean, I guess I kind of am an intellectual dominatrix. When they say really ridiculous things, I kind of challenge them to see whether they can unwind what they've just said or if they just double down on the stupidity, right? And I mean, that's the kind of thing, that's the thing that got me you know, famous most recently was I, I was invited, I thought, to do this talk for a bunch of wealthy people on the future of the digital economy. And it turned out, they, instead of bringing me out to the, to the stage to do something, these five dudes came into the green room and sat around this table and started peppering me with all of those really, you know, binary questions that you don't ask someone like me. I mean, they, they were like, you know, uh, uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, right, or, or augmented reality or virtual reality, like which one should they bet on? And it's like, I'm a media theorist, but I'm wrong about those things. I was like, I would have said Betamax, right? Or, <laughs> CompuServe, right? I mean, I was right, but wrong, right? I mean, I was right in the sense I didn't know what was happening, but don't, don't look at me to place your bets. But they were doing all that, and then finally they got around to the question, Alaska or New Zealand? Right, where should they put their bunkers, right? So here's these five billionaires, or four billionaires and one almost billionaire tech bro dude, who are asking a, a, an anarcho-syndicalist Marxist media theorist, right, ex-theater director Jew from New York, where to put their friggin' bunkers for the event, right? The electromagnetic pulse, or pandemic, or climate catastrophe, or, or revolution that, that leads to the end of the world as we know it, and forces them to retreat to, a, uh, 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 to their dream home. Um, and again, because this is the way I am, so I kind of tweak them. I'm like, okay, so you've got your bunker in New Zealand or in Alaska, right? Then, what about the rest of us? They're like, huh? Well, what about everybody who comes and then wants your food and shelters? And, oh, we've got Navy SEALs for that. You know, they're already standing by. Their helicopters are fully gassed. You know, one push speed dial button. They're activated. They come, they go, and they meet us at the compound. It's like, oh, you've got Navy SEALs. So, again, the tweaker. Um, I'm like, so how are you going to pay these people after your money is worthless? They kind of stop. Like, they never even thought of this. They don't even watch Walking Dead or something. He's like, what are you thinking? Right? 
One of them, he opens his little moleskin book and he's like, how to pay security after the, like he's gonna ask his financial advisor or something, right? And we get on this long conversation, and that's where they start saying, well, you know, uh, I'll be the only one who knows the combination to the safe where we keep the food. It's like, oh, Navy SEALs have never had to try to get information out of anybody before, you know. You can just spend your apocalypse being waterboarded, right? And then someone else is like, oh, we're going to have little, you know, little implants that are going to control where people can go in the facility, and we could always use them as kind of like impromptu shock collars if they get out of hand. It's like, oh, Navy SEALs are going to respond really well to that, you know. And don't worry, Army Rangers won't respond well to that either. All right, so they, they double down. You see what they do? They double down. They can't they can't kind of unwind their thinking. They just want to go, you know, further into it, further into it. There's another fix on top of that, or a, a shock collar, or this, or that. And what I, what I realized speaking to these guys is, and it sounds odd, but I don't believe they're building their bunkers or fantasizing about their bunkers because they're afraid of some bad thing that's going to happen. I think the bad stuff in the world that might happen is their excuse for investing in their fantasy of this crazy, isolated, bizarre life above and apart from the rest of us. You know, it's like Gomez Adams and the millionaires of that era, they had those train sets that they would build, right? What, for these guys, this is their train set. Their, Bunker, their, their apocalypse place with the heated pools. I remember one guy was showing me the plans with the heated pools. And I'm like, I know this person in our neighborhood that has a heated pool. You know there's a truck in front of his house all summer from the company bringing the new filter and the new heater and the new this. I'm like, where are you going to get the parts for your heated pool after the apocalypse? Are you 3D printing this stuff? Again, the Moleskine book, parts for heated pool. Right? And I, I've spent most of my career blaming capitalism for this, right? Which we could do. Those of us who were here at South By even in the early 90s, the, the pre-wired uh, uh, internet of the late 80s and early 90s, we know what the internet was for, what this was supposed to be about, right? The, the wild uh, uh, possibilities of the unbridled collective human imagination, right? The point of the net originally was we were going to fuck things up, right? It was going to be a new, unpredictable, crazy future world. This is why they had to hire psychedelics users to program the early computers, because psychedelics people were the only ones who were comfortable hallucinating a new reality. And it's true. I knew these people. They would work at Intel during the day and come home to the, you know, Oakland at night and scrape the peyote buds off the cactuses and trip their balls off at night and then, you know, have a sun workstation at home and make fractals that would then get projected at a rave. Right? That's who we were, right? Then along came, at least in the, the narrative as I understood it, along came Wired magazine. Right, and recontextualize this digital renaissance as a revolution for the NASDAQ stock exchange. That thanks to digital technology, the stock market, the NASDAQ stock exchange will grow exponentially uninterrupted forever. That was called the long boom. And even Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve, believed this, right? He said, we're in a new paradigm. This is gonna keep going forever. But it really wasn't just that. You know, it's, it's also that there was, and I, I didn't want to really believe this, but there is something intrinsic to the tech mindset that somehow yearns for this kind of disconnection as well. Not all of us, but there's a tendency. And, and I, I remember it was around, oh God, 89 or 1990, I was at Timothy Leary's house. For those of you who don't know, he was a great counterculture figure, psychedelic dude. Um, I was at his house when he was reading Stuart Brand's book on Nicholas Negroponte's Media Lab. You know, the Media Lab at MIT where all this digital stuff was happening. 
And he's reading this book with these felt tip pens and circling all this stuff. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is great. Tim is on board the digital revolution. This is going to be wonderful. He's reading this thing, reading this thing. And by the end of the afternoon, he slams the book and he throws it across the room and he goes, Bleh! like he's vomiting it up. Like, Tim, what, what? And he goes, first, less than 3% of the names in the index of this book are women. Right? And this is like 1991 or 1990. That was early to make that kind of observation. He goes, you know it's going to be fucked up if there's less than 3% women. And he said, the second thing is, what these guys are actually trying to do is recreate the womb with digital technology. He said, uh, their, their mothers were probably unable to anticipate their every need when they were babies. And now they want to build a digital womb that will know what they want before they know they want it and bring it to them. You know, they, they will be kind of disconnected. And the apocalypse is just the excuse for them to build that. That's what I'm realizing. It's the excuse for the dream to be realized. Because these guys, they want to go meta on reality. That's their job. The bunker the, is the ultimate exit strategy, right? You don't just exit your business, you exit from this, from the people, right? What, did, what was Peter Thiel doing yesterday, the day before, when he called his companies, when, they, when, he, when he texted whatever and said, hey guys, pull out of that bank. We're going, let's watch everybody else implode, right? As long as you've got a fast enough algorithm or fast enough ultra fast trading mechanisms to get out of that bank before everybody else, push the trigger first, right? But that, well, that's Peter Thiel's whole philosophy, right? What's his book, remember his book? It's called From Zero to One. What does that mean, go from zero to one? It means you should, and he says this, you need your business to operate one order of magnitude above everybody else. They're all competing down here on the ground. You have the transformative idea that lets you rise an order of magnitude, zero to one, or one to 10, or 10 to 100, above the others. That's what Web 2 was about. Remember Tim O'Reilly and Web 2? Oh, you go, you got your dot-com companies, all the dot-com companies compete. What you want to do is not be a Web 1 company competing down there on the ground, but aggregate. So if there's all these travel sites, you become the aggregator of travel sites one level above that. That's web two. You've gone meta on web one. But what happens when there's a bunch of different aggregation sites? Well, then I guess you become an aggregator of aggregators and an aggregator of aggregator of aggregators, right? You keep going meta. That's what Zuckerberg's doing. Zuckerberg was the, the ultimate web two company, the one that, that Teal loved, right? Everybody's competing for status and all that. So we're going to create the site that lets everyone compete for status and form scapegoats and do whatever they do. And now what does Mark Zuckerberg do once like Sheryl Sandborg jumps ship and the, the Congress is all mad at him and nobody really likes it? I don't this is not fun anymore, right? I'm going meta, literally meta. And what's meta for him? I'm going to take a bunch of technologies that nobody really knows what they are, right? Say crypto and VR and Web3 and just, and, and, and make it, throw them in a basket, an AI, and call it meta, right? Because it's, it's whatever it is, it's meta, and I declare it. I declare I'm one, one level above you all. Or Kurzweil, the ultimate digital dream, right? I'm going to rise from the chrysalis of matter as pure consciousness, right? Or Sam Altman, just to upload to the fucking cloud. Pure meta, right? That's the pure digital dream. It's not even the, the traditional one, right, of, of, of living in a cubicle being serviced by, you know, strange sex robots. <laughs> You're not even in the body. I mean, that first image of, of Zuckerberg's Web3, that was the accurate one, right? Nothing below the waist, please. Nothing below the waist. That's the dream. All right, I'll put legs on the fucking thing if I have to, right? We meant that we were going to put legs on there all along. No, they weren't. It's going to keep going up until it's just here. Right, but this is, this is what, we, what we're looking at. You know, so I, I, I blamed capitalism, and then I see it, oh, no, no, it's digital. 
and the way digital and symbol systems and all goes meta. And then I'm like, no, it's actually the problem here is the way these two worlds, these two languages, these two mindsets dovetail together. Right? Digital and finance were made for each other. Right? What is digital? Digital is a symbol system. Right? Digital is not real. It can feel real. It's not real. What's an MP3? It's a bunch of numbers and codes that, when played back, can imitate the sound of music. Right? It's almost more a metaphor for music than it is, than it is music. I mean, listen to real music live in a thing. Listen to an MP3. Right? It's stimulating your little ear holes so that that's like music. But it's not music. Right? It's not hang on the bass speaker at a fucking concert and you'll, you'll know what music is. That stuff that's coming, that's moving the wind in the room, that's music, it's something else. But digital is those symbol systems, right? What is finance? Finance is meta business, right? I might be transacting with someone. I'm gonna buy a chicken from you and you're gonna buy a, a, a sh some shoes from me. Caesar, right? He's gonna, he's gonna, we're gonna, that's a transaction. What is finance? Finance is someone else going, those two people are transacting. How can I make money off that? How can I own the game, right? So I'm going to invent central currency. So if you want to buy a chicken from Caesar, you're going to have to borrow money from me and then use that money to, to buy the chicken from him. But you're going to have to pay me back money for that. But that's what central currency was about. You're going to loan money into existence. You're going to get back more than you loan. That was great for co colonialism. It was great for the expansion of the economy because it has to grow in order to pay back the bank. But what is it? It's financialization or stock, right? Even if you have stock in a real company, what is the stock really owned by now? It's owned by the derivatives, right? There's a, there's, there's a, a company that's creating value. There's stock you can have in that company. There's derivatives you can have of the stock, right, which is that stock theoretically three months in the future. Then there's derivatives you can buy of the derivatives and derivatives of those derivatives and credit default swaps if the derivatives don't work and the derivatives don't work and the derivatives don't work and it doesn't work. Right? But the derivatives exchange in a digital marketplace, because digital loves abstraction, right? Digital doesn't need the real world. Digital is great at derivatives and derivatives of derivatives and derivatives of derivatives, right? Oh, it's all there. It's part of that world. It's all abstracted. Digital lets us do an infinity of derivative synthetic instruments on top of the economy. Because the derivatives exchanges were so amplified and magnified by digital technology, in 2013, the New York Stock Exchange, which was already an abstraction of the real market, which is in a sense an abstraction of human need, it was consumed by the derivatives exchange. The iTex derivatives exchange bought the New York Stock Exchange. Right? So this abstraction was consumed by its own abstraction. That's what happens in digital. We get further and further away from terra firma, from actual people, from what's actually happening here. And that's been, I would argue, kind of the purpose of this, of this way of thinking, of this mindset. And I've been trying to figure out where the heck did it come from? And there's a few places you can look at on where this kind of anti-human, rise above the humans, abstract yourself from the humans mindset, this way of understanding the world comes from. You can look at scientism for that. I don't mean real science. I mean the scientism, the, what, what Francis Bacon was talking about. When he was arguing for implementing empirical science in the Renaissance, do you know what he said when he was selling empirical science as a new way of, of thinking about the world? He said science will let us take nature by the forelock, hold her down, and submit her to our will. You know what the forelock is? Hair, right? We're going to take nature by the hair, hold her down, right? He picked the pr pronoun. He picked a specific pronoun. Hold her down and submit her to our will. So science for Bacon and the Royal Academy of Scientists at that time was a rape fantasy. We're going to take nature, hold her fucking down, make her do what we say. Why? Because nature's scary and soil and fairies and worms and darkness and forest and moons and unpredictability, right? Nature is like the early internet. 
All that weird-ass Gaia, crazy, grateful, dead, psychedelic, mushroom, fractal stuff. Right? It's more like a fantasy role-playing game than a good Aristotelian movie, right? It keeps going. That's the scary thing. It keeps going. It keeps going. It keeps going. That was the funny thing, and, that, and I haven't told people this one. When I was with those crazy billionaires, um, I remember I told them uh, the way to make sure their security force doesn't kill them in the bunker. I said, why don't you pay for your head of security's daughter's bat mitzvah today? And so, oh, you mean like be nice to the security people, and then maybe now, and then they won't kill us then. So, yeah, be nice to them, and maybe their families. So, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. You them and their families, maybe some of their families' friends. Yeah, that makes sense too. And then one of the guys said, yeah, but where does it stop? <laughs> where does it stop? Oh my God, you mean you might have to be nice to everybody? Huh? Well, I didn't, why was I earning all this money in the first place, right? But it's that you've got to get away. You've got to get away from the humans. I mean, that's the history of the way we understand labor, right? And certainly in a digital age, how do you know if you have a successful business plan? Doesn't need people. No employees, right? It can scale infinitely through algorithms and you don't need all those fucking workers, all those people. Where did that come from? That's as old as technology. That's as old as industrialism. When we were in school, we were taught the assembly line and machine processes and factories. That was all to make more goods, right? More goods more efficiently. It's not what the assembly line was for. The assembly line was there so that you wouldn't have to hire competent workers. Right? People used to exchange and trade the value they made. If you were a competent shoemaker, you made shoes, you went to the market, and you sold the value that you created. Once you had chartered monopolies, meaning you were the only one who could do business in a particular sector, and you're going to go hire people to work in your shoe company? Are you going to hire skilled craftspeople? No, you're going to go to the medieval equivalent of the Home Depot parking lot and find unregistered aliens, bring them in, train them in 15 minutes how to put one nail onto the bottom of the shoe and pass it to the next person. So the assembly line itself holds the knowledge of shoemaking, but each individual worker is oblivious to it and should be. Because if they know, if they have skills, then they can demand more money, right? Then they can set the terms. No, you want them utterly replaceable. So that was the beginning, but we still think of workers that way, at least under digital industrialism. We still think of workers that way, and we still think of humans that way. Right? What we did was we reversed the polarity of technology from the early fringeware. You all remember fringeware, Austin, the Austin people? The early fringeware, Mondo 2000, boing boing understanding of technology was that it was empowering people, right? People were going to use technology to create new, unpredictable, wild, creative things. But once you're betting on technology with capital, do you want wild, unpredictable things to happen? No, you want the most predictable things of all to happen. You want your bets to work out. So we reversed. Instead of people using technology to make things happen, we use technology on people to make them more predictable, to control them. Human beings are the problem, and technology is the solution. Right? Are you solving for people? No, we're solving for business. Right? We used social media. I mean, we tried. Boy, they tried. They had a good decade. We're going to use social media the way like Bateson and Mead really would have, would have uh, uh, understood humanity as some servo control mechanism. We're going to use social media to control all these humans. And they tried. Boy, they tried. They took the Vegas slot machines and stuck them in the algorithms and did all that social dilemma kind of stuff. But the odd thing about the social dilemma is none of it's actually true. It didn't work. Right? They couldn't control us. So what are they going to do instead? Replace us. Right? That's what AI is for. It's funny. I think of social media was like the missionaries. Do you ever see that movie, The Mission, by Roland Job? It's a great movie. The missionaries, right? The Catholic Church and the, and the royals, they sent the missionaries to America and South America first. And what did the missionaries do? They converted a lot of the indigenous people to Catholicism. But what they also did was they studied the people. What are their customs? How did they think? And they sent all this information back to their home countries, back to the king. Who came next? Conquistadors. 
right? The conquistador is using all the, using the fact that people have been trained to like this culture and to speak the language and to believe in their gods. Then you send the conquistadors who have all that intelligence and they conquer the people really fast. Social media was like the missionaries. Right? Oh, this is fun, it's all fine, it's social. We're gonna learn all about you and how to cater to you and all our little algorithms and all. And then, and now we're here, the AIs are here, who know how to use every piece of information that social media, that we gave to social media to now. Boy, this is gonna be interesting. I was at one of those, uh, you know, foo camp, those things? I was at a foo camp, which are fun. It's these Friends of O'Reilly gatherings where, and you're not allowed to share what gets said there like by name, but there's, what are they called? Charnel house, Charnel house rules, Chatham house. There's a thing, Charnel house is something else, I think, I swear. You, you, you get meat, I think, right? The Chatham house, yeah. So these rules, but you're allowed to share. So there was a guy who was the head of one of the, the, the social media apps on your phone right now. Um, and he came to me and he said, Doug, you know, you've written a bunch of like medium posts that are kind of really negative on uh, uh, AI. Aren't you scared that when AI is in charge, they're gonna see what you wrote <laughs> and come after you? And he's like, I really hadn't thought about it. And he says, oh dude, you know, I don't say anything at all on any social network or anything about AI, so they won't know. And I'm like, if the AIs are so smart, right, aren't they going to be able to infer from your selective removal of anything about AI from your feed how you feel about them? He goes, oh, fuck. <laughs> right, it's that thing, it's, it's so fun to tweak these people, right, because they're so much smarter than us on the one hand, but so dumb on the other. It's partly because they get plucked from college when they're like 19 years old, right, to go become founders of things. And it's like they didn't take history, ethics, philosophy. It's like transfer parental authority onto a friggin' VC, and what do you think you're going to get, right? So what, what I'm trying to do, rather than gloat, which is still fun, um, rather than gloat at the impending fiasco that we're about to witness, and it's funny, every time I come, I came here in March of 2000, a similar moment. Um, these, they keep happening. I came here right, right before the mortgage crisis or right during it. And now, now, um, this is an interesting moment for those of you who don't know this big bank. There's a lot of stuff tied up in there. There's a ripple effect. It's interesting. And this thing that happened at the big bank partly happened because of bad communication. They really, and greed, and I mean, we can talk about that. We can do our, our post-mortem when it's actually mortemed. But um, boy, the bank communicated to its shareholders what they were doing to shore up its balance sheet. And they didn't think about all those customers. And they didn't realize that, that Twitter is much faster than Edgar and CNBC at communicating what your company is doing. All you need is one tweet from a Peter Thiel saying, uh, look what they just, they're just raising money. I wonder why. Let's be on the safe side. That's enough. That's enough. But anyway, I don't want to gloat because I've already had I have two friends with companies who've had to lay off workers already because their um, payroll is not going to, they're going to be able to download their payroll. So real humans are suffering. Real human, uh, real human workers are uh, having immediate effects from this kind of thing. It trickles down really fast to, to you and me. Of all things that trickle down, it's never the money, right? It's, it's this part. But what I'm looking at is, is how to engender the kind of change we need. How can we kind of change the register from extractive digital industrialism to something much more uh, mutual or communitarian or fun um, not necessarily psychedelic, but, but more loving, more caring. What, what can we do to move from this panic of the billionaire mindset, which I think is finally dying its appropriate death, to something else? And it's always important, and I want us, all of us who are, I know a lot of you are on the side of social good and all that, I want to, to uh, implore us all to stop using the language, how do we get people to blank? How do we get people to give more money to them? How do we get people to start companies? How do we get people to think like, once you're in the how do we get people to, 
right? Then you're doing things to people. Then you're back in the manipulating people. Even if it's like, oh, what memes could we put out that would make people think like, no. You don't want to get people to do anything. That's the techno solutionist's mindset, right? That's the problem I've always had with the kind of humane technology, right? Let's make, how can we do all these nasty things to people more humanely, right? Humane technology, it sounds like cage-free chickens or something, right? We're still eating their eggs, right? Or, or the chickens themselves. It's like, no, no, no. It's not about how do we make technology treat humans more humanely. It's about reversing the polarity altogether. Right? It's not about doing things to humans. It's about creating the conditions under which humans can begin to do the things they really want to do, which is a very different understanding of it. And it's hard, it's, it's a hard switch. So I've been looking at, and, and I came up with kind of four uh, interventions, let's call them, for changing the register. And I'll try them out here. I haven't really spoken about them before. And I, I realized as I was, as I was developing these that they kind of come from the history of the last 30, 40 years or whatever I've been writing. So the first thing that I do in my work and that I'm imploring we start doing is denaturalize power. Right? And what does that mean? It was really what I was trying to do in the book Life Inc. that I wrote when I was like, look at this stuff we call money. This is not money. Right? This is a kind of money that was invented by particular people at a particular moment in history who have long since left the building. Right? That's denaturalizing. I remember the first experience I had it was, um, of, of, of denaturalizing power was when I was, um, first time I really used a real computer at college in the computer lab. And the graduate student, when I was done with my session, she asked me, how do you want to save your file? As a read-only file or a read-write file? I'm like, what do you mean? She said, well, a read-only file is one that will be saved and someone else can look at it. A read-write file is you save it, but someone else can change it. I was like, oh, all right, I'm going read-write. You know, and I left that room thinking, wait a minute, I've been raised in a world with read-only media. Television has been read-only. Money is read-only. Why is money read-only? Right? They made a law for money. If there's a law that it's read-only, that's how you know it really shouldn't be read-only. Right? It's because the only way they can prevent us from turning it into a read-write medium is with a regulation. And I started walking around thinking, my God, all this stuff could be read-write. I'm living in a read-write universe that has been arbitrarily limited to a read-only read world. I can, we can make our own TV. We were just getting VHS recorders around then, too. We can make everything. We can DIY. We can, we can participate in that. So the first thing was that, was how do you denaturalize power so that people stop accepting social constructions as conditions of nature? They're not. They're not. They're social constructions. They're laws made by people at particular moments in history to promote certain agendas and certain power relationships. And once you do that, once you see the world like that, then the next step is to trigger agency. Right? And that was what I was trying to do in the book Programmer Be Programmed. Even just with the title, people don't read books, but they read titles and that's enough if you can really nest it in there. Right? <laughs> If you're not doing the programming, then you are, chances are you are being programmed, right? So how do you trigger people's agency to actually do the thing, to actually realize that we are in charge, that we can program reality to our own specifications? Right? The third thing, and this was really my book Team Human, was I realized in order for people to actually act with agency, we have to re-socialize people. Right? You can't do this alone, right? no matter what the tech bro says. You can't do it alone. It doesn't work. Once you get to the Gini number of one, everybody else is dead. Right? You don't want all the toys. If you have all the toys, then why are you going to go to someone else's house? Right? There's no toys there to see. You don't want all the toys. Right? So re-socializing people, and this means going against, I know, the whole religion of Silicon Valley and their whole bastardization of, of Darwin and, 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 and Adam Smith and everybody. Right? The, the, the libertarian bastardization of God bless libertarians, you're all good, it's all fine, but your understanding of Darwin is wrong. Darwin did not say we're in a battle for survival of the fittest individual. There's like one paragraph about that. Read The Origin of Species. 
Page after page, this dude is marveling at the way species collaborate and cooperate in order to ensure mutual survival. That's the dance of nature. How did that work? And as now we know, thanks to our, our mushroom users, the trees are communicating under the ground through a network of mycelia, right? We were all taught in middle school, remember the big tree crowds out the little tree for light and then it gets all the light and the little tree dies? It's not what's happening. Big tree is getting light and sharing it through a network of mycelia to sharing its nutrients with the little tree the whole time. Then when the big tree loses its leaves in the, in the winter, the little evergreen then shares stuff back with the big tree. They're talking, communicating, trading, and the mycelia are getting a, they're actually financializing, they're getting a, a uh, uh, some profit, their, their, their little toll goes back and forth between them, right? But we are like trees, we can be part of that thing, right? When, when you experience yourself in connection and collaboration with other people, it's all happy, it's all good. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Francis Bacon was wrong. People are nice, dirt is nice, worms are nice, fairies are nice, the moon is nice, darkness is cool. I mean, why is darkness scary? Because the boundaries go away, <sighs> right? How do I be one better than them if I don't know where they are, right? Which is why finally, the, the fourth thing that I, that I wanna do, and this is the one that sounds the most new agey, and I don't mean it like that, although if you're new agey, sure, to take it as a, as a prop. Um, cultivate awe, A-W-E, cultivate awe. You know, this is what I really was writing the book Present Shock about. That Present Shock that was about the assault of all of our uh, 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 communications technologies, you know, making us uh, 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 basically interrupting the present, right? You can't be where you are now because, oh, there's an alert, oh, there's an alert, oh, there's an alert, and we think that we're catching up with our alerts, but the alerts have already happened. You are in the now, the alerts are in the past. They are, you know what I mean? They're, they're keeping you from being now, present. But awe, really what, what we're talking about is moving from the dopamine rush of the instant technological hit to the oxytocin rush of connecting with everybody else, of actually having that social experience. And we know that medically, I mean physiologically, after an experience of awe, People's cytokine response, it, it, it affects your cytokine. It basically, it helps regulate your immune response. Your immune system gets stronger when you've had an experience of awe. You're more generous. If you've had an experience of awe, you're more generous for like 72 hours after that experience of awe. Why? Because an experience of awe means experiencing yourself like, you know, like Buddha orders his hot dog as one with everything, right? You have that moment of I'm one with, and then of course you're gonna be generous because I am you and you are me and we are me and you know, it's everything's together. You're connected to everything all at once right now. So those are the four, denaturalize power, trigger agency, resocialize people and cultivate awe. Those are the ways in which I would want to celebrate the end of the billionaire mindset. Because in reality, you know, Economics, and I studied economics. In theory, that's like my PhD is in digital economics. I mean, I kind of made it up, but still, um, it counts in the, in the world of these things. Um, economics is the last resort. Economics is what you do if the social fabric didn't work out. Then you gotta go back to the ledger, to the tally, and see, oh, and mathematically what happened? Who owes what to whom? Someone's mad, someone's upset. Oh, look, this kid is crying, so let's do some economics now. But the social fabric should be doing that, right? As my, as my, my, my good friend Cory Doctorow brings up, you know, when, when you gotta drill a hole in the wall in your house and you don't have a drill, what do you do? You go to the Home Depot, get a minimum viable product drill, right? Use it once if it works to drill the hole in the wall, then stick it in the garage, and by the time you try to use it again, it won't recharge and blah, 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 and you throw it out. So, right, so you send some kids into the mines to get the cobalt and rare earth metals to make this damn rechargeable piece of crap. You use it once, and then you throw it out, and some other kids in Brazil are going to have to pick over the, the, the waste heap where we send the stuff down to find the renewable part. Where what you could have done was knock on Bob's door, Bob's always making stuff. You knock on his, hey Bob, can I borrow your drill? And Bob's got a big metal fucking kick-ass drill. And you're like reaching for it, and he's like, and Bob's like, you know, 
I'm going to come over and drill your hole for you. And you come over and you'll see where you made the X. And you go, you don't put the hole there. There's no beam back there. I got a stud finder here. He's going to find it and he's going to drill you a, a great hole in that wall. And put up the picture. Of course, the problem is now, what do you owe Bob? Oh, shit. We're going to have to invite Bob over for our New Year's party now? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> but that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, because Bob, he can walk over. He doesn't need to park. He's not going to take any space away from the people who are coming. From. It's Bob. And Bob turns out he's nice, and he's got a good baritone. When you're singing the carols, it's all good. Right? But we experience that as bad. We forgot. I mean, when someone comes to your neighborhood, when they move in the neighborhood, what do we do, or what we used to do anyway? You go over with a plate of brownies, right, when they arrive. Why do you do that? Because you're thinking, oh man, these people aren't going to have enough brownies when they get, they need brownies. They really want their kids climbing the walls, you know, the first night in the new house when they can't sleep. Let's give them some sugar. No, what you're doing is you are uh, uh, inviting them into social obligation. You give them this so they owe you something. And that is a gift in a community, to owe something to the other. Now they have an excuse to come to you and say, oh, you know, we notice your, your sprinkler's a little off. You know, my, my uh, son knows how to fix those. You, know, you have a reason. They have a reason just to bring the fucking plate back and have another conversation. You're trying to, you're trying to enmesh them in the mutuality of social obligations. Right? The economics is for when those social obligations don't function for whatever reason. And even, you know, economic, even technology should be understood as something of a last resort, when you really just can't do it with your hands. Because right? if you rely totally on the technology, you become enslaved to the tech. I mean, we've all experienced it, right? I'm a slave to my, to my, uh, my mouse and keyboard. I mean, my body has changed, right? Because I'm, it's like... Think about technologies as, as you should be able to let them go, right? And be fully human. Any, any technology, yes, it expands you in a certain way, but it amputates you in another. It's a great thing to use when you want to use it. I mean, what's the first thing the Israelites did when they got out of Egypt and they're in the desert when they just escaped from, from whatever their, 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 their uh, uh, at least mythical and sla slavery? It's the first thing they did. They gave themselves the Sabbath. Right? They gave themselves the Sabbath not just as a worker thing, which is nice, a worker thing. They gave them the Sabbath because what they were communicating was like, Mr. Rogers, you know, you are okay just the way you are. You don't need to work. You don't need to produce in order to justify your existence. Right? Human beings are more than our utility value. We have intrinsic value. And that's still so hard for people to get without getting all religious and crazy and, God forbid, spiritual about things, right? But we each have intrinsic value. We come in. You, you deserve your place just for the price of admission. You made it here is the celebration, right? But the biases of the digital media environment are telling us that we are our utility value. And that's why we are so busy using technology on ourselves to auto-tune ourselves. Even the way we talk about taking friggin' microdose mushrooms is to tune yourself to this society. No, take a fistful. <clears throat> God damn. Don't meet it out. Here's one. Here's another. Right? Take it as long as you don't get high. It's all good. But we're auto-tuning ourselves. And think about that. I mean, I understand why they auto-tune Ariana Grande, say, right? Little Ariana, ah, and she hits her note, right? And it's, ah, right? So you can auto-tune, so, ah, and it's perfect, right? The perfect commercial product, right? Hi, see, it's right there, ah, right? And the technologist would say, anything off that note, that's the noise, right? The note is the signal, and her, ah, is the noise. All right. What about James Brown? When James Brown is reaching up for that note, oh, I got you, Doug. I got you, Doug. Right? Now we're going to know, we're going to auto tune him. I got you, Doug. I got you, Doug. What have we done? We've auto tuned him. Right? But we've eliminated, literally, we've eliminated the soul from the music. 
The soul is his reaching up. The soul is his coming down in over the note. The noise, if anything, is the note itself that every player, piano, and digital MIDI blah blah can play. The signal is his way he reaches up to the note. That's the human being. But that's the human. When you read uh, James Joyce late at night, and you have that, I mean, if, or whoever you read, but think about if you've ever read James Joyce, not Finnegan's Wake, too hard, but if you like Ulysses, say, you read that, or if you don't want to read Beckett, read Malloy or Murphy, there's good, for me, those are the ones that did it. You read Ulysses late at night, and there's a moment when you're reading it when you go, James Joyce is speaking to me right now. Do you know that moment when the liter I'm the one that he wrote that for. That is, I prompt, that is James Joyce's soul touching your soul. That is real, right? And the extent to which we can accept that that is real gives us the fortitude, the ammunition, the courage, and the heart to fight back against a billionaire mindset that sees us as product to be consumed, not as human beings to celebrate. Okay, thank you. Let's, uh, let's talk amongst ourselves, yeah? Thanks. Cool. All right, let me, let me tell you this. I'm going to sign, I'm supposed to be pitching my book. I got a book, Survival of the Richest Escape Fantasies of the Tech Billionaires. I'm going to sign them right after this is over in the convention center. You should know where that is by now. The convention center on the third floor, 10C. If you don't remember that, just ask people. 10C, third floor convention center. I'll be signing books and talking to anybody who wants to talk or play or take pictures or play games. But um, let me, I'm going to use this thing. Thank, oh, see, they're seamless. Seamless, that was human beings that did that. I want to acknowledge, thank you. Um, how do you see AI for the future of humanity? I would like to see AI for the future of humanity. Um, I, don't, I don't currently see it as for the future of humanity. I see it, I see it as, as you know, I mean, at this point, I see it kind of as the conquistadors. I'm not afraid of the AI itself. I'm afraid of what people want to do with the AI. You know that, that New York Times article that came out, the guy kind of uh, entrapped the Bing AI into acting like a sociopathic, jealous person, told, it to, told him to leave his wife, that his wife doesn't love him and all that. That scared me not because I thought AIs are going to try to do that to us, but because I realized AIs know already know more about us than our therapists, right? AIs already know more about manipulating human behavior than the best behavioral finance guru. So if they are told by companies to get what you can from this person by any means necessary, they're going to figure it out, right? And they're not going to do it by making us happy, right? They're going to do it by, by something else. So um, I'm, I'm concerned with how how we program them. And again, I'm thinking that the only real, um, in a world where regulation doesn't actually exist, um, the only way that we can, uh, and I wouldn't even say fight back, but um, uh, maintain ourselves and maintain our humanity is going the more homeopathic, naturopathic route, right? So rather than attacking the sort of the allopathic model would be let's attack the AI, what we have to do is increase our cultural immune response, right? Our, 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 and that's through the things I was talking about, through re-socializing and having experiences of awe. The more you're having those social oxytocin awe-like experiences, the less you're going to crave the addiction of dopamine and the more you're going to want to melt into the, 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 you know, the joy of being human with other ones. So the, our, real, our real defense against it is going to be uh, raise the level of our, of our human connection. Do you think if there were more female billionaires, the mind, oh, it's gone. Oh, there it is, would be different. Is it all related mostly to patriarchal society? Well, yes and no. I mean, I kind of trace it back to the Aristotelian narrative arc. 
you know, which is kind of the male orgasm curve of, of history, right? Crisis, climax, sleep, right? The character does a lot of decisions, makes them get to that, uh, um, and over the, and that, that, um, that shape is, you know, quasi male. Um, but, you know, and then I look back, I read uh, Rianne Eisler on this stuff, and she traces it back to metallurgy. You know, when we, once we had metal tools and we get the sword, which is cutting and breaking and, and, and destroying, it was a, uh, it, it basically we got swords and chains out of metallurgy and we got dominator societies and that's when we moved from uh, partnership models to male dominator models. No, but, but for sake of argument, the female, the few female billionaire tech bros I have met are just as billionaire tech bro as the male ones, you know? They may lean in while they do it, but it's the same fuckery. Um, what would second generation social media platforms look like? All of them are second generation social media, because real world is the original social media platform, right? We have the best one, right? And in this social media platform, sorry if there's kids here, we can actually fuck in this one. Do you know what I mean? It's like, this one is so good, and look how fast, I mean, turn your head really fast. Look how fast it renders. I mean, <laughs> it's like, Fuck, this is good, right? So they're all, sec they're all second generation, and so far I think they all kind of suck. Um, I don't think they're good at socializing. I don't really, uh, the only things I'm finding successfully socializing in digital spaces is bringing people from far apart with a common interest together, but they're small. You know, and I know, I'm not saying that the app is great, but like I'm finding deeper conversations on Discord or on my, on the Mastodon instance that I'm on. It's like, I, I, I feel like socialization is enhanced by boundary. And I don't mean necessarily racial boundary or belief boundary, whatever, but um, you think like a Dyson vacuum cleaner, you know, when you get the happens because they bound it in those little cyclone things. It's the same with money, right? If you want to see the circulation of money really go up, you do local spending so you see the multiplier effect because it's not sucked out into something else. You create an artificial boundary so that things circulate. So I would think the generation of social media platforms that I would like to see I think they will work by being contained, by not having the aspiration for scaling, right? Scale is the enemy here, right? Human beings don't live at scale. We live in this little thing. It's like, fine, I don't, I'm not gonna get all Dunbar religion on you here, but, but we do function, it's like you don't have to be everything to everyone, you really, don't, that's industrialization, and when we try to do that to yourself, brand yourself so that you can scale to the thing, it's just not happy, you know? There's a few, let Taylor Swift live at scale, God bless if she can do it, right? But, um, boy, you can live locally, and you know, my greatest theater experience was in a class in college. It wasn't even a whole weekend play. It was this one friggin' moment, and that's enough. The 12 people were there, it was witnessed, it was great, I mean, it's really, it's that. Um, do I think the really rich guys will invite me back? Um, <laughs> sometimes they, they have, um, but no, I actually, when the book came out, when it was actually published, I lost two talks right away, two real money talks. Um, the mistake was, I mean, they were into the whole Team Human thing, because Team Human they like, because it sort of sounds like, you know, HR, right? <laughs> how to manage your team, you know? And then the mistake was my speaking agent emailed them and said, instead of buying copies of Team Human, why don't you buy Doug's new book, Survival of the Richest? And they're like, what's that? And they go, um, what's the cancellation fee on this? Right, so I lost a couple, but I've made a few too. And in terms of the, the, the dominatrix stuff is going better than ever, right? Because I've sort of outed myself as, as the punisher. Um, God. Um, how do I think Marshall McLuhan, do you see those? Oh, I only see them. Um, what do you think Marshall McLuhan would say about tech and AI right now? Um, honest, he'd say we went, we took a wrong turn at the printing press. You know, he was a medievalist. What he would say though, 
and did say is that digital, the digital media environment would at its best retrieve the medieval. Right? I still see digital not as a revolution but as a renaissance. A renaissance means the rebirth of old ideas in a new context. The last renaissance what did we get? We got centralization, we got central currency, we got the nation state replaced the city state, we got the subjugation of women, we got uh, uh, monarchs, we got co colonialization. I mean, they pitched it as something happier, but that's, we got perspective, right? But we repressed a whole bunch of stuff. So now if we have a renaissance, we get to retrieve all the stuff that was repressed in the last renaissance, right? Women. Paganism, nature, mushrooms, uh, uh, nature, uh, cyclical understandings of things, the indigenous people that were repressed during the Renaissance, all that stuff comes back. So what McLuhan would say is we, I mean, he was a church man, so he would say, we'll get the commons, right? Which we hopefully will, right? The commons, which was a church thing, and we'll get um, manuscripts, we'll get uh, uh, writing. And we're kind of, I think we're kind of seeing that. I would say the wickification of the net, which is still happening in a lot of ways, is, is that. So yeah, I think, I think that's what he would say. Um, what boundary should be removed in the tech startups world to improve the ecosystem? The tech startup world is not an ecosystem. Sorry. Um, what boundary could be removed to make the tech startup world an ecosystem? Um, it's the whole, the tech startup world is just wrong, right? The whole way, the whole way it is. The tech startup world is based on the premise of an exit. How do we exit? And it just doesn't work. The, the boundary that should be removed would be, let's say uh, we reverse the tax code so that capital gains are taxed high and dividends and income are taxed low. How would that change the startup ecosystem? All of a sudden, you'll have investors who are like, no, no, don't exit. I don't want a taxable event. I'm cool with revenue. So why don't we think about a way to make this company actually work for a long time and help people? And yeah, so that one, that would be a good one. Um, all right, we got three minutes, so I want to. Uh, let's, let's do four questions at once. You comment on souls. What do What do we do when the billionaire mindset contributes to the death of the flesh slash soul? Ooh. Two. What are the risk red flags of education designed by billionaires? There are lots of certificates coming from big techs and being more valued than BA degrees. Um, what is the examples of business to get human to be more humane? What do you think about Web3 purpose to bring sovereignty to people? There are good projects. All right. The way I would bring this the, together. The billionaire understanding of the realized soul is the self-sovereign individual. Self-sovereignty is an oxymoron. You can't be king and subject. You can't be king of yourself. Right? That's the way, basically, that's the freelance life, right? Where you, I mean, if, you, if you're a freelancer, you know what I mean, right? You're your own boss, and I'm such a bad boss to me. I'm killing myself here, right? <laughs> but the self-sovereign individual is like this weird, uh, 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 you know, snake eating its tail sort of, so I'm so self-sufficient, I am king and subject of my own nation of me. Right? In that Mobius strip construction is the death of the flesh soul. Right? That is the negation of the carnate being. Right? All I am is the rule set, the program, and the machine. Right? So to the education model, what we have to do, I think the easiest way to break that 
is to change the purpose of school right now. You talk to school principals, talk to the presidents of universities, and you know who they're meeting with to find out how to change their curriculum? They're meeting with tech bro billionaire CEOs. What skills do you want our students to have? What skills do you want our students to have? I'm gonna pay $80,000 a year to train myself for this friggin' corporation or my public school? Since when is the purpose of public school to, be a, a, the, to absorb the externalized cost of worker training for corporations? School was the opposite. School was invented for the opposite reason. It was to give the coal worker a bit of dignity. So after they got out of the coal and went home at night, they can open a novel and read it and understand what it said. So they could read the newspaper and be informed about the issues and vote effectively. It was compensation for a, a life of work, not the path to a life of work. So if we flip education on its head and say this is not about increasing the utility value of these students, but increasing the awareness of the intrinsic human value of these people, we flip the whole script just like that, right? They are no longer in the machine metaphor or the digital metaphor for learning and experience. They're in a room with a teacher. They're doing Want to give some feel, some props? Feel. They're doing mimesis, okay? They're looking at a human being up there learning, exploring, understanding, and their bodies are mirroring what that is in real time and real space, right? And that, you know, that is a, 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 a reinforcement or acknowledgement of the, the basic human dignity that everybody has. And that's, you know, what we all need to learn to be students of. Okay, thanks a lot.